I'm in the media technology area, and there's always, I'm carrying this <laughs> this morning, and I'm reminded with the slides and the videos and all of this stuff that uh, we all have a problem. We have a big gap. We say we're digital, but we're not so interactive as, as organizations. We're passionate about our missions, but walk up to each other and say, why this, why now, why you, and so what? And a lot of people kind of stutter about that. We're in the social impact business, but some people still think that that's kind of being too superficial. And we know how to sh tell our stories, perhaps better one-on-one -on -one than we do to sharing our stories with others. And stories especially that can prove our impact. Um, we talk about what we want to do. But I've noticed now that the Ford Foundation, we at Columbia and other places are now getting into, okay, that's a vision statement, but mission statements now need to be active. They need to be change narratives. They need to talk about the impact and prove it. Dr. Casey talked a lot about the waning credibility or uh, trust factor. I think it's something a little different. I think the cause for this is because we're caught right now in a world between new power and old power, old power and new power. Uh, much of our hearts and minds are now moving outside our organizations and our institutions. And like sand against limestone are being somewhat uncomfortably corroding, <laughs> uncomfortably changing, not toppling our institutions, but making for some uncomfortable change. And I think therein is some very positive things. This is not a downer uh, speech. I'm going to just run through these slides, and I'm not going to teach you about the printing press, but I just want to remind you here that we've gone from one to many. The big paradigm shift is always about media. Uh, one to many. Then one to one with the telephone and the telegraph, okay? Then we went from some to many with uh, TV, network TV. We had recorded sound, music, uh, radio, we started speaking to each other and having platforms to convey, and that was the late 20th century model, right? Well, this thing that looks like a peacock that ran into a windscreen is the Internet. A bunch of circles and shapes and, and people talking against each other and with each other and all sorts of things. And in all of those earlier models, we were in the center our institutions were in the center. But now, with the internet, our institutions are somewhere in there, but people are talking many to many and often not with us. So it compels us to have kind of a new way to approach things. We are living in the most expressive time in human history, but we're having trouble figuring out the signal from the noise, right? So in this uh, topic of this talk is how technology is helping us to have make change and impact, um, and it certainly is. Uh, these conversations that are happening often without us, and some often that we don't know about because we're not listening, are the reasons why we're struggling with public support or public credibility. We're not connected. Uh, we're not often talking to the people we serve. We're not listening to whether what we think is right is actually working. This is a wonderful example. This was the night that uh, Mubarak, um, this is Twitter. How many of you are on Twitter? Okay. How many of you despise Twitter? <laughs> Probably the same number. Anyway, what is so great is this back channel that we're not listening to. And this particular one is the red on the right. All those circles are circles of influence. And the red on the right are is the news breaking of Mubarak during the Arab Spring and in Tahrir Square uh, finally stepping down. And the red are Arabic speakers. There are purple circles in between that are people uh, translating from Arabic to English, and the blue are the English speakers. And that's about seven hours, right? CNN didn't have that news for 23 hours. And so much of that news was either biased or incomplete, right? 
But what we learned, what I learned on the Upper West Side of New York that night at 2 a.m., <laughs> listening to Al Jazeera and watching my Twitter stream, uh, gave me that information faster. So speed right now is, is really something we need to be aware of. So we're seeing this now. We're seeing people coming together, organizing with these tools. It's easier to do it for good. It's easier to do it for bad. It's just easier to do it. And now people are doing it because they know they're going to be filmed, and in that filming they're going to be shared, and it's becoming a, a, a way to self-organize around what you believe in. I know that sounds obvious, but people say this is chaos. The world is going to hell in a handbasket. What, are the, what is the nonprofit sector? What are NGOs doing about it, right? Well, I don't think it's so much about chaos around the world, nor the end of civilization as we know it. I think it's rather a symptom of old power's reluctance to accommodate new power and this new power's ability to be seen and to be heard and to scale by many of us in this room or many of us outside this room, right? So we're not listening to each other so much, but we're trying. And one of my favorite people uh, and innovators and new power leaders in this sector, Henry Timms, uh, founder of Giving Tuesday, um, one of his, my favorite quotes is, our job now as social change makers is to create a shared space for people to come together. We talk about collaboration, but let's talk about our role. Think of yourself as a conductor of electric current and your content, your media, as a way to access the grid. We're talking about electric, electric circuitry here. And it's a fabulous way to start looking at this as we go from currency, money, dollars, the 1%. And we see how this media has created a way for the 99% to come to the table. Voices, issues, things that others weren't, people in old power were not really embracing all the time or weren't handling in ways that, that would make people heard more forcefully around the world. So we're going from currency now to current, this idea of social capital, this idea of um, how we talk about ourselves, what we say about our stories, how we can uh, communicate with people and collaborate with them and curate and bring them together in a joint conversation is really critical, I think. Yes, there's the dark side. This was just from last week. Facebook enabling advertisers to reach Jew haters. So it's that problem where the ACLU is uh, First Amendment rights, everybody has free speech. Free speech from those we love, free speech from those we hate, right? <laughs> it's just the free speech, right? We also see this exclusive here. Russians appear to use Facebook uh, uh, to um, push Trump rallies in 17 U.S. cities. And so, you know, we're seeing all of this connectivity uh, strain our um, attention spans, and in a world of what we call FOMO, fear of missing out, where we're tied to our tied to our cell phones and and to to figure out what's going on and are we safe? Right? There is some good news <laughs> as we all try to figure this out together. And I think there's three forms of new power for good that media technology is helping to bring to the table. Uh, it's giving us new ways to see. Like it or not, we've got a lot to look at now. But it's giving us new ways to see, and these cell phones in our pockets, of course, have alerted us to new ways to look at what's going on in our communities, our imbalances, police violence, uh, police brutality, uh, people's stories of issues that we hadn't heard about before. Uh, in one way, we're just a number. You know, it's kind of, okay, how am I feeling today? How is my eyesight today compared with yesterday? A lot of these vanity technology plays. But now we also see groups like Data Kind and young data uh, technologists coming together uh, to help people um, do good in society, whether it's shortening uh, school bus routes over the city or figuring out uh, where police violence is happening. Uh, not just saying it's happening over here, but having the figures to see where it is happening so those donor dollars can be targeted more wisely to affect change. Ushahidi, making crisis maps, showing, uh, using data to show people about a problem, show where it's happening in real time, and create new um, invitations for intervention. Um, 
uh, New York City, that NYCLU story, that Datakind, they did work, uh, Datakind worked with the NYCLU and found that nearly nine out of ten stopped and frisked New Yorkers were completely innocent. And so it's one thing to say that we stand for something. It's another to deal with the changing reality of what is actually happening there, which is giving us new opportunities to make impact, which is what it's all about. Stellar new examples of, of data. Um, the crisis text line. Uh, they not only have external use of data to make change, but internal data. Uh, this is uh, monitoring. They're working with MIT and some other folks to collect data from people's texts. Uh, it started out as a young person's group where they'd have a cause of the month and they were communicating with these teenagers by text and found out that uh, a full 20% of what they were getting, the information they were getting over the text, was not so much about those causes per month as it was about their cutting. Uh, there's violence at home. Uh, there are uh, problems with bullying. And so the people who created this young person's uh, uh, nonprofit, do something.org, decided to create another one that would just start handling te a crisis text line and helping these people work through this. And they have started to create a huge data bank that is collecting data that shows uh, that all... Um, States uh, experiencing anxiety over the week. Wednesday is the biggest anxiety day. Who, who would have thought? My household, it's Monday, right? Uh, <laughs> then all states, uh, what hours of the day? They even see that in Minnesota, uh, during a certain time of day at a certain school, uh, there are uh, uh, calls and texts to a suicide line that, that seem to go up on a certain hour of a certain day. And by sharing this information, this gives, it's not so much surveillance as it is um, some problem solving that uh, gives us an opportunity to do that. So um, do something also is using this data to look internally, finally figuring out that they have six programs that are doing really well. Thank you very much. But one is doing really, really well, and they don't need the other five <laughs> to make the same, if not more, money if they focused on it and to really get efficient in that way. So it's new ways to see. The data will inform. Hopefully it will never drive, but will always help to make us better and our performance on impact. Uh, media technology also obviously gives us new ways to share Here's one example, <laughs> overdone. Our president is always sharing, right? But the kind of sharing I'm talking about is, is um, giving people information who didn't have it before and putting those tools to share that information. Um, sharing, uh, knowing that an earthquake in Sichuan in 2008 that wiped out one school and a child uh, that killed the family's only child. Uh, it wasn't just that one school. It was 10 schools. It was 20 schools. It was m pretty much all the schools in the country because of bribery and poor construction. But that would have never been admitted to, and that would have never been shared or learned uh, if it weren't for even on the censored Chinese Weibo, uh, network, uh, people weren't sharing their stories and their grief. So it's a, it's a powerful new level of accountability that people are able to see. There's also opportunity for a lot of nonprofits to give their stories away, help their, have their supporters join with them in the experience of what they are doing for a cause. And this is very clever we have the uh, senior vice president of Apple giving up her 53rd birthday to raise $101,000 and take a selfie in the process and put it online. You've got uh, a skateboard uh, hero uh, doing the same thing. You've got a group of guys who are climbing Mount Kilimanjaro, and they're going to make it into a fundraiser. So it's this kind of sharing that a lot of the millennial generation, younger generations, are used to doing things in groups. They always have, ever since they were children, and they are coming into prominence wanting to have and do things in groups as well. 
here's a little girl who ate rice and beans for an entire month and, and committed that to the cause. But we're also seeing now the new stuff is co-presence, which is empathy and some experimental models on um, how to use technology to reach across the years or the generations or uh, our geographical distances to put us in the same room, literally. And I'm going to try to play this. This is Mr. Pincus. Before we do, this is Mr. Pincus. And Mr. Pincus... Um, came to visit a class, and he was a Holocaust survivor, and he was there to answer some questions uh, from the students and talk to the students and so forth. The only thing is Mr. Pincus wasn't really in the class. Mr. Pincus was in a hospital uh, across the world, and how could he be in the, in the same place with the students? This is a hologram. Mr. Pincus with technology, is able to speak with these students and through all sorts of layered, complicated technology, is able with keywords and, and prompts to be able to answer questions. Let's see if we can share a little bit of this because I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of this in the future. But what this does is Holocaust isn't just a story grandma or great-grandma is telling us. It, we can... We can speak with it. And there are many applications for many causes around the world with this kind of technology. Can we see? Okay. Um, we also use, well, well, that was a story, and I told the story, and it was very interesting. And, and uh, if you can see it, that would be great. There's also another example of how Syrian refugees, uh, you can use conferencing technology to take students. There's one group that is taking students in one room in L.A. to talk to um, Syrian refugees in Jordan. And they're all of the same age group, and they're sharing um, their complaints, their hopes, their dreams. Uh, and uh, the Syrian refugees taught the uh, people in south-central L.A., some of these teenagers, disaffected teenagers, many of them, that they could uh, grow healthy food. <laughs> so they started gardens all over L.A. Uh, interesting use of sharing. Um, the, the hope with VR, and of course I think it's still within or without, outside our reach, is that it's a machine, but through this machine we become more compassionate, we become more empathetic, and we become more connected, and ultimately we become more human. That's the hope. But certainly, uh, how many of you have children who use Snapchat? Okay. Well, augmented reality is also one of these technologies that is being used to connect people, put them, make them co-present with the cause. This is a museum in Chicago that is trying to recreate some of the city's uh, major events and talk about what existed there. Uh, and they are superimposing, using iPads, uh, pictures, and in some cases, moving pictures to scale. So that if you go on a, on a tour of the neighborhood and you hold up your iPad, you can see what happened there in real time. This is application. I have a, a client in Athens who is now doing this to tell the stories of what these stones are and why the government in the middle of an economic crisis is saving the stones uh, using uh, the money uh, in a difficult economic time to, to save the Acropolis. So these stories have, are being told and used to... Uh, uh, create support through new generations for some of these cultural centers. Um, so lots of promise. This is the Chicago River, and here's what happened there. Um, in the 1800s, uh, uh, there was an accident in the river and a boat capsized, and there's all sorts of storytelling around that. Um, in Syria, the fear of the sky. This was a 360 um, they needed to raise uh, uh, awareness that barrel bombs were happening, and so uh, the 360 video took you to that neighborhood, and you could walk around and interact with people there, not based on somebody's bias, based on um, actual interviews with people, so you could really understand it. And how many of you have, have strapped on some VR goggles? And what was your experience? Were you moved... Yeah. Right. 
<laughs> exactly. It was so compelling. Who else uh, want, uh, did VR, have strapped on VR goggles who have a good shirt? Yes, sir. Yes. You manufacture it. Okay, so you know. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to tell you about it. I know you're favorable to it. Here's another simple one. These are veterans of uh, a war who are have are sick, terminally ill, and uh, they want to go back one more time uh, to see the battlefields and to see the friends uh, that they um, uh, that made such a difference in shaping their lives uh, and their outlooks. And so this is being done. And here is one to train children about the toxins in their water and to make monsters of them, but it's a use of augmented reality to help people achieve it. So I'm talking about this because this is the new ask. This is connecting with people. This isn't saying what our vision is. This is uh, using media to create stories uh, uh, as service and stories as ways to really make people feel relevant and understanding, and it does build em empathy. Charity Water used VR glasses at their latest fundraiser and to, to talk about the wells that they're building in Africa. And they had a donor come into the office, showed him the film, and after taking the headset off, he gave a substantial amount of money we weren't expecting. Yes, some of this is novelty, but some of it is also an effort to connect people who don't usually get invited to things. Charity Water also brought people to the table. A lot of food banks are bringing people to the table, either physically or through the use of VR. But most importantly and most exciting, I think, is, is that uh, media technology is having an impact because it's showing us new ways to collaborate. Um, the obvious crowdfunding stuff. I mean, say what you will about crowdfunding, but, but there's a lot of money that is being raised by people to help other people. And there's a lot of accountability around that now that's growing uh, not just to send blankets to people in 110 degree climates, <laughs> they don't need them, but to really get focused about this, especially if this is being done in collaboration with um, NGOs and organizations that can have an impact on this. Or uh, to show and tell. This is Charity Water again doing an eight series webisode to take people with them on the journey um, using media to tell stories. This is something called ReWord that is crowdsourcing people that come to the site through uh, technology to help get rid of bullying language where they find it on the web. And so far they've been able to uh, change 150, edit 150 million uh, bullying uh, derisive terms uh, out of public media uh, and uh, uh, the reaction, favorable reaction in polls is 84%. Um, 90 Second Street Y is doing Giving Tuesday. That's another form of distributed collaboration that's very exciting and spreading around the world. Um, and even more important is um, a lot of foundations are coming together to do tests on how cities can collaborate to make real impact, not just talk and don't we wish we could do this, but to really um, have an impact on uh, reducing, um, increasing equality and reducing uh, racism in their cities. And um, uh, I am executive producing right now a, a project with um, that's trying to bring together people on food to end hunger faster and uh, do that kind of collaboration. And I just want to play this, if you can click on it. So uh, collaboration, data, storytelling, all that stuff is as important, too. And I thank you for your patience and for listening. Thank you.